Chapter Five of the Blythedale Romance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Blythedale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter Five. Until bedtime. Silas Foster, by the time we concluded our meal, had stripped off his coat and planted himself on a low chair by the kitchen fire, with a lapstone, a hammer, a piece of sole leather, and some waxed ends, in order to cobble an old pair of cowhide boots, he being, in his own phrase, something of a dab, whatever degree of skill that may imply, at the shoemaking business. We heard the tap of his hammer at intervals for the rest of the evening. The remainder of the party adjourned to the sitting room. Good Mrs. Foster took her knitting work and soon fell fast asleep, still keeping her needles in brisk movement, and, to the best of my observation, absolutely footing a stocking out of the texture of a dream, and a very substantial stocking it seemed to be. One of the two handmaidens hemmed a towel, and the other appeared to be making a ruffle for her Sunday's wear out of a little bit of embroidered muslin which Zenobia had probably given her. It was curious to observe how trustingly, and yet how timidly, our poor Priscilla betook herself into the shadow of Zenobia's protection. She sat beside her on a stool, looking up every now and then with an expression of humble delight at her new friend's beauty. A brilliant woman is often an object of the devoted admiration, it might almost be termed worship or idolatry, of some young girl, who perhaps beholds the cynosure only at an awful distance, and has as little hope of personal intercourse as of climbing among the stars of heaven. We men are too gross to comprehend it. Even a woman of mature age despises or laughs at such a passion. There occurred to me no mode of accounting for Priscilla's behavior, except by supposing that she had read some of Zenobia's stories, as such literature goes everywhere, or her tracts in defense of the sex, and had come hither with the one purpose of being her slave. There is nothing parallel to this, I believe, nothing so foolishly disinterested, and hardly anything so beautiful, in the masculine nature, at whatever epoch of life, or, if there be, a fine and rare development of character might reasonably be looked for, from the youth who should prove himself capable of such self-forgetful affection. Zenobia happening to change her seat, I took the opportunity in an undertone to suggest some such notion as the above. "'Since you see the young woman in so poetical a light,' replied she in the same tone, "'you had better turn the affair into a ballad. "'It is a grand subject, and worthy of supernatural machinery. "'The storm, the startling knock at the door, "'the entrance of the sable knight Hollingsworth and this shadowy snow-maiden, "'who, precisely at the stroke of midnight, shall melt away at my feet in a pool of ice-cold water, and give me my death with a pair of wet slippers. And when the verses are written and polished quite to your mind, I will favor you with my idea as to what the girl really is. Pray let me have it now, said I. It shall be woven into the ballad. She is neither more nor less, answered Zenobia, than a seamstress from the city, and she has probably no more transcendental purpose than to do my miscellaneous sewing, for I suppose she will hardly expect to make my dresses. "'How can you decide upon her so easily?' I inquired. "'Oh, we women judge one another by tokens that escape the obtuseness of masculine perceptions,' said Zenobia. "'There is no proof which you would be likely to appreciate, except the needle-marks on the tip of her forefinger.' Then my supposition perfectly accounts for her paleness, her nervousness, and her wretched fragility. Poor thing, she has been stifled with the heat of a salamander stove, in a small, close room, and has drunk coffee and fed upon doughnuts, raisins, candy, and all such trash, till she is scarcely half alive, and so, as she has hardly any physique, a poet like Mr. Miles Coverdale may be allowed to think her spiritual." "'Look at her now,' whispered I. "'Priscilla was gazing towards us with an inexpressible sorrow in her wan face, 
and great tears running down her cheeks. It was difficult to resist the impression that, cautiously as we had lowered our voices, she must have overheard and been wounded by Zenobia's scornful estimate of her character and purposes. "'What ears the girl must have!' whispered Zenobia, with a look of vexation, partly comic and partly real. "'I will confess to you that I cannot quite make her out. However, I am positively not an ill-natured person unless when very grievously provoked.' and as you, and especially Mr. Hollingsworth, take so much interest in this odd creature, and as she knocks with a very slight tap against my own heart likewise, why, I mean to let her in. From this moment I will be reasonably kind to her. There is no pleasure in tormenting a person of one's own sex, even if she do favor one with a little more love than one can conveniently dispose of. "'And that, let me say, Mr. Coverdale, is the most troublesome offence you can offer to a woman.' "'Thank you,' said I, smiling. "'I don't mean to be guilty of it.' She went towards Priscilla, took her hand, and passed her own rosy fingertips, with a pretty caressing movement, over the girl's hair. The touch had a magical effect. So vivid a look of joy flushed up beneath those fingers, that it seemed as if the sad and wan Priscilla had been snatched away, and another kind of creature substituted in her place. This one caress, bestowed voluntarily by Zenobia, was evidently received as a pledge of all that the stranger sought from her, whatever the unuttered boon might be. From that instant, too, she melted in quietly amongst us, and was no longer a foreign element though always an object of peculiar interest, a riddle and a theme of frequent discussion, her tenure at Blythedale was thenceforth fixed. We no more thought of questioning it than if Priscilla had been recognized as a domestic sprite who had haunted the rustic fireside of old before we had ever been warmed by its blaze. She now produced out of a work-bag that she had with her some little wooden instruments, what they are called, I never knew, and proceeded to knit or net an article which ultimately took the shape of a silk purse. As the work went on, I remembered to have seen just such purses before. Indeed, I was the possessor of one. Their peculiar excellence, besides the great delicacy and beauty of the manufacture, lay in the almost impossibility that any uninitiated person should discover the aperture, although to a practised touch they would open as wide as charity or prodigality might wish. I wondered if it were not a symbol of Priscilla's own mystery. Notwithstanding the new confidence with which Zenobia had inspired her, our guest showed herself disquieted by the storm. When the strong puffs of wind spattered the snow against the windows and made the oaken frame of the farmhouse creak, she looked at us apprehensively, as if to inquire whether these tempestuous outbreaks did not betoken some unusual mischief in the shrieking blast. She had been bred up, no doubt, in some close nook, some inauspiciously sheltered court of the city, where the uttermost rage of a tempest, though it might scatter down the slates of the roof into the bricked area, could not shake the casement of her little room. The sense of vast, undefined space, pressing from the outside against the black panes of our uncurtained windows, was fearful to the poor girl, heretofore accustomed to the narrowness of human limits, with the lamps of neighboring tenements glimmering across the street. The house probably seemed to her adrift on the great ocean of the night. A little parallelogram of sky was all that she had hitherto known of nature, so that she felt the awfulness that really exists in its limitless extent. Once, while the blast was bellowing, she caught hold of Zenobia's robe, with precisely the air of one who hears her own name spoken at a distance, but is unutterably reluctant to obey the call. We spent rather an incommunicative evening. Hollingsworth hardly said a word, unless when repeatedly and pertinaciously addressed. Then, indeed, he would glare upon us from the thick shrubbery of his meditations like a tiger out of a jungle, make the briefest reply possible, and betake himself back into the solitude of his heart and mind. 
The poor fellow had contracted this ungracious habit from the intensity with which he contemplated his own ideas, and the infrequent sympathy which they met with from his auditors, a circumstance that seemed only to strengthen the implicit confidence that he awarded to them. His heart, I imagine, was never really interested in our socialist scheme, but was forever busy with his strange and, as most people thought it, impracticable plan, for the reformation of criminals through an appeal to their higher instincts. Much as I liked Hollingsworth, it cost me many a groan to tolerate him on this point. He ought to have commenced his investigation of the subject by perpetrating some huge sin in his proper person, and examining the condition of his higher instincts afterwards. The rest of us formed ourselves into a committee for providing our infant community with an appropriate name, a matter of greatly more difficulty than the uninitiated reader would suppose. Blythedale was neither good nor bad. We should have resumed the old Indian name of the premises, had it possessed the oil and honey flow which the aborigines were so often happy in communicating to their local appellations but it chanced to be a harsh, ill-connected, and interminable word, which seemed to fill the mouth with a mixture of very stiff clay and very crumbly pebbles. Zenobia suggested sunny glimpse as expressive of a vista into a better system of society. This we turned over and over for a while, acknowledging its prettiness, but concluded it to be rather too fine and sentimental a name, a fault inevitable by literary ladies in such attempts, for sunburnt men to work under. I ventured to whisper Utopia, which, however, was unanimously scouted down, and the proposer very harshly maltreated, as if he had intended a latent satire. Some were for calling our institution the Oasis, in view of its being the one green spot in the moral sand-waste of the world but others insisted on a proviso for reconsidering the matter at a twelve-month's end, when a final decision might be had whether to name it the Oasis or Sahara. So at last, finding it impracticable to hammer out anything better, we resolved that the spot should still be Blythedale, as being of good augury enough. The evening wore on, and the outer solitude looked in upon us through the windows, gloomy, wild, and vague, like another state of existence, close beside the little sphere of warmth and light in which we were the prattlers and bustlers of a moment. By and by the door was opened by Silas Foster, with a cotton handkerchief about his head, and a tallow candle in his hand. "'Take my advice, brother farmers,' said he, with a great broad bottomless yawn, "'and get to bed as soon as you can.' I shall sound the horn at daybreak, and we've got the cattle to fodder, and nine cows to milk, and a dozen other things to do before breakfast. Thus ended the first evening at Blythedale. I went shivering to my fireless chamber with the miserable consciousness, which had been growing upon me for several hours past, that I had caught a tremendous cold, and should probably awaken at the blast of the horn, a fit subject for a hospital." the night proved a feverish one. During the greater part of it I was in that vilest of states when a fixed idea remains in the mind like the nail in Sisera's brain, while innumerable other ideas go and come and flutter to and fro, combining constant transition with intolerable sameness. Had I made a record of that night's half-waking dreams, it is my belief that it would have anticipated several of the chief incidents of this narrative, including a dim shadow of its catastrophe. Starting up in bed at length, I saw that the storm was past and the moon was shining on the snowy landscape, which looked like a lifeless copy of the world in marble. From the bank of the distant river, which was shimmering in the moonlight, came the black shadow of the only cloud in heaven, driven swiftly by the wind, and passing over meadow and hillock, vanishing amid tufts of leafless trees, but reappearing on the hither side, until it swept across our doorstep. How cold in Arcadia was this! End of chapter 5